Please bow with me in prayer. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will come and unstop ears and melt hearts, change lives. Also, please humble one who would dare speak in your name. It's in that name we pray. Amen. Probably a number of you have seen the 1994 film Quiz Show by Robert Redford. And some of you are seasoned enough to remember the events it was based on when they actually occurred, which you see here on the screen. In 1958, the most successful television program in America was the game show 21. Two contestants were put in isolation booths, couldn't hear each other, headphones on and all. And they were given questions of varied difficulty. Harder ones were worth more points, and if their score came to 21, they won thousands of dollars. Each week there was this massive publicity stunt, if you will, of the, the questions in a sealed envelope being moved from a bank vault by armored car to the NBC studios uh, before the game show. It worked a little bit like Jeopardy, where if you won, you came back and there was the next challenger you would meet and you could stay for a long time if you were excellent at it. The longest running uh, contestant was Charles Van Doren. He was handsome and he was brilliant. His father and his uncle, I believe, were both Pulitzer Prize winners. His mom was a novelist. Um, for weeks, he beat every contestant that he faced. What the viewers did not know was that the show was rigged. Contestants were given the questions and answers right before the show, and whenever the ratings were falling, they were told to give a wrong answer, and someone more photogenic would be put in. So it was discovered later. Uh, the show made millions for the network NBC and for their sponsor, Geritol, an iron supplement, you may remember, <laughs> until a lawyer named Richard Goodwin became suspicious. A congressional investigation followed in which Van Doren was called to testify. He, he surprised everyone by reading out a full, complete, heartfelt confession. And when he finished, one committee, af committee member after another stood up and, and thanked him for being honest, saying, you know, this is something we rarely encounter. Until the uh, congressman from Long Island, New York, uh, Armenian-American Stephen Darunian, stood up. He wasn't quite so impressed. He was grateful that Van Doren had given the confession, but he disagreed with his colleagues. He said, I don't think an adult of your intelligence ought to be commended for simply, at long last, telling the truth. At least in the movie's presentation of it, the audience rose in thunderous applause. But I wonder if that kind of agreement, that vigorous response, would be the same today. Our scripture text this morning is simply two individual verses, separated by something like 1,500 years but they're profoundly connected. First, the ninth commandment, Exodus 20, 16, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And second, Jesus' charge in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. You shall not, instead you will. Do not be an untrue witness. Instead, be a witness of the truth, Jesus Christ. Do not testify falsely to harm your neighbor. Instead, testify in Holy Spirit power to benefit your neighbor. You know, sometimes I think the Ten Commandments get a pretty bum rap. Maybe it's the thou shalt not thing. Seems like a lot of finger wagging or something. The perception of that at least. And of course there's the ratio thing, eight commandments to two in terms of the don't to the do. Not kind of a, not very uh, attractive, a negative to positive ratio there. Perhaps it's simply hard to feel warm and fuzzy about commandments. It's true, they are clear and firm and required boundaries. God presented them to the people he redeemed from slavery. People who could receive them with gratitude 
and with understanding. That's how he prefaces the commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. So they're not mere rules for random people. Instead, they're actually ten pictures of a God who has brought salvation to his people. And to his redeemed people, God's commandments reveal his nature, his priorities, his actions, how he has acted and how he will act. I mean, think about it. Obey the Sabbath, fourth commandment. God says directly, on the seventh day, he paused and savored the goodness of creation. Honor your father and your mother. Consider how Jesus Christ, the son, does that perfectly. Do not commit adultery. God refers to us as his beloved, the bride of Christ, and he is ever, always, eternally faithful to his covenant with us. And right down the line of all the other commandments, including our focus this morning, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. It's not only a rule, but a revelation of who God is. So we're called to speak truthfully Because God does. And how does he do that? Psalm 19 shows where I think God's truthful testimony begins. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. As we listen to creation and examine its wonders, creation testifies accurately of who God is. Our creator paints and sings and writes and speaks, fashions in every way, always truthfully. He's not a liar or a deceiver. There's no false testimony in his fashioning of this universe. God's very first witness to us is trustworthy. And a bonus, it's beautiful. The psalm then goes on to praise God's second truthful testimony to us, his literal word. It says, though I won't quote the whole rest of the psalm, the law of the Lord is perfect. His statutes are trustworthy. His precepts are right. His decrees firm and righteous. And as the Apostle Paul later assures Timothy, all scripture, all this scripture is God breathed. Hence, it's his truthfully spoken testimony. Testimony in creation, testimony in his word. But of course, the clearest, most complete, greatest testimony God gives us is Jesus Christ. He is the word made flesh, proven true. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the subject and the object and the exclamation point for all scripture. As Revelation 3 says, he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of creation. What a comfort that is to to know that our trust in Jesus is well-placed. His testimony is valid, his claims reliable, his promise is sure, himself the very definition of truth. So God testifies truthfully in creation, in scripture, in his son. How do we testify truthfully? We imitate that. We speak truthfully about God's world, about God's word, and about God's son. We speak truth about the observable realities around us, about scripture, and about Jesus. In a former life, really truly several former lives ago, I was a math teacher in a neighboring state, and a student cheated on a test. Uh, It was pretty easy to spot. I mean, the answers were identical to another student's, identical in their uniqueness, and in their wrongness. And as I found out not long afterwards, the student had paid $5 to the other student for their answers. The problem was that that other student was getting a D in the class. So, well, yeah, not smart. 
but we had a meeting then between uh, myself and the student and the student's parents and the principal of the school. And the principal relayed a story of his wife's experience uh, at her employers that I've never forgotten. Um, the wife was an administrative assistant in an office of a business person of some sort. A call came in for the boss, and uh, she said, the phone call is for you. And he said, tell him I'm not here. She looked at him and said, I, I, I won't lie. I won't lie. Come on, it's not a big deal. Just tell him I'm not here. I'm sorry, sir, I won't lie to you. But I'll also never, pardon me, I won't lie for you, but I'll also never lie to you. An employee deserves a raise, right? If the people of God are committed to always being truthful, even or especially when it's inconvenient or contrary to our immediate interests, then our gospel witness will carry a credibility to be seriously contended with, not dismissed without a second thought. As individual believers, as this local body of Christ and the church global, we should be united in speaking and validating truth. We must be absolutely, unequivocally, relentlessly, famously truthful. We must be determined to steer clear of falsehood. And yet, believers... I think we've increasingly struggled to achieve this. The story is told of four high school boys who couldn't resist the temptation to skip morning classes. Never happened here, never happened with any of you, but it did here. Bad case of spring fever or whatever. After lunch, they showed up at school and they told the teacher, I'm sorry we're late, we had a flat tire. Well, they were pretty relieved when the teacher said, I'm sorry, you missed a quiz, but I'll, I'll give it to you right now. Sit down and take out your pencil and paper, which they did, thinking they're going to get off pretty easily. And she said, question number one, which tire was flat? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that that kind of teacher would not be fooled no matter what. But what if the boys did all answer the same tire? What if they were consistent in a simple, factual element? I think she might reevaluate her assumptions about the larger scenario and at least investigate a little further. One of the most important aspects of always telling the truth, always being truth tellers, as I mentioned a moment ago, is that we are truthful even in the little things. Or to state it in the negative, if our witness is false, about seemingly small things, then our credibility is lost when testifying of greater things. If there's something in the sermon this morning that I feel most personally burdened about for the church today, this might be it. Acts 20, verse 16, do not bear false witness, is an all or nothing requirement because upon it hinges all or nothing of Acts 1.8, if we are to be witnesses of Christ. If we're to be Christ's witnesses testifying about the big stuff, divine realities, Jesus, gospel, resurrection, salvation, if we are to offer such truths that are invisible and, and very foreign and, and difficult for non-believers to swallow, we will only have credibility and any hope of being believed if we also testify truthfully about little stuff. The most basic, observable, demonstrable events and physical realities of life. Do we want skeptics to believe he is risen? Well, we couldn't say something like the earth is flat. It's the same with other big truths like ethical teachings in scripture. The church will only have credibility and a chance of being listened to when we speak into topics such as life in the womb and sexuality and ethical issues of all sorts. Only if we're first deemed trustworthy on verifiable facts like the moon landing happened, the Holocaust was real, the Sandy Hook school shooting did occur, 
and a million other more provocative blanks I'll let you fill in. And of course, everyone wants to jump to political stuff, but what about things like the recently publicized denial and cover-up of extensive abuse in a major Protestant denomination? When Christians can be legitimately charged with silencing or distorting any truth, we violate the commandment, Exodus 2016, and we therefore devastate the truthful witness Christ calls us to in Acts 1.8. This is something we should deeply grieve. Grieve for victims who have endured so much evil. And also grieve that hiding and denying sin testifies so falsely about Jesus. And a commitment to truth-telling is only going to get harder. Artificial intelligence its pretty cool in a million ways. It can be used to do a lot of amazing and helpful things. I don't think most of us really understand how it works. I sure don't very well. But it also frightens the daylights out of me. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a tech scholar, and I'm not a cultural prophet, but it only takes an amateur to imagine the greatest casualty of AI's advance could, could be truth in its most basic form. How will I know if that video clip is just propaganda, malicious, or is it actually real? We are on the precipice of crazy uncertainty about basic, observable, factual reality. It is really important that Christians have courage to humbly and earnestly speak deep truths of our faith, and never more so when those around us may be sprinting headlong away from them. But to be trusted in any way whatsoever when it comes to such weighty matters, we must speak truthfully about everything. Only then will our witness of spiritual realities be untarnished, unhypocritical, and be powerful. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be kind of hard to not become a cynic about everything we see and hear and read in this AI world, isn't it? We're going to need tremendous discernment about sources and biases and agendas and evidence. All of us are likely to be duped at times. And while we probably can't eliminate that risk, we can at least lean away from testimony about such things. We can avoid promoting and furthering potential fictions, avoid endorsing verbal violence, untruths, and unchristlikeness of all sorts. In doing so, we'll avoid false testimony that undermines our spirit-filled witness of eternally important truths. I don't know how you eat them. I just dip them in milk and eat them straight up. Maybe that's boring. I don't pull them apart and all of that. But if you'll permit me a ridiculous metaphor, I should separate them and eat only the magnificently truthful chocolate and cast aside the fluffy falsehood. There's nothing tasty, nothing righteous about mixing truth and falsehood. A very positive example of separating truth and falsehood, one that I think of immediately, is, is this. It's a watershed commitment in the founding of the denomination of this very church, firmly rejecting slavery, insisting on abolitionism. Standing with the oppressed like that testifies to the truth of the nature and mission of Jesus Christ. It's obedience to Exodus 20 and its accomplishment of Acts 1. In the church, we can debate a billion things. Contemporary worship songs versus historic hymns. Calvinist theology versus Arminian theology. Trickle-down economics versus a welfare system. Gas cars versus electric. Bills versus patriots. Not that last one. No debate there. <laughs> it's the Philadelphia Eagles. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, way, way, 
way too often. We have a tendency to elevate many of our differences to double stuff Oreo status and allow them to hinder warm fellowship between believers. I can be especially self-righteous and dismiss you and your intentions the moment your interpretation of a given scripture differs from mine. Much more often than not, we need to be challenged on how quick we are to dismiss one another rather than humbly welcome and listen to one another. But let us also never forget. It is an illusion. It is a lie that the compromise of truthfulness ever helps spread the gospel of Christ. It is a tempting misconception that violating Exodus 20 might help us achieve Acts 1. The kingdom of God is never advanced by speaking falsely. I can accomplish great Christian things if I'm willing to overlook a little lie here or there. No. There's no moral equivalence between truthfulness and falsehood. And it's not a higher goal to preserve the unity of the church than to preserve the truthfulness of the church. Any presumed unity divorced from truth-telling is just grudging coexistence. It's just temporary tolerance, sullen apathy. Proximity to one another is not a sufficient witness. Sharing a pew in and of itself does not require the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. But shared truthfulness frees us to be wildly diverse, otherworldly in our welcome of one another. Truthful testimony is the basis for a spiritual unity that loves diversity. A no-fear unity like that is a witness for Christ that the world will stand up and take notice of. Take notice in wonderment. Lastly, one of the surest ways to give truthful testimony is when we take to heart the words of Wesley. Not John or Charles. Probably some of them would be good too, but Wesley, spelled with a T, W-S-T-L-E-Y, from the Princess Bride movie. Perhaps you just learned a new thing, spelled with a T. But his line we could take well to heart. We are men of action. Lies do not become us. We are people of action. Lies do not become us. Our testimony becomes a witness of the truth when we act like Jesus Christ. I have frequently admitted to being only a partial fan of St. Francis of Assisi's famous line, preach the gospel at all times, if necessary, use words. Uh, I mean, I say partial because gospel is literally good news. There's no gospel without the testimony of Christ's coming and crucifixion and grace and resurrection and return. But while I may not be able to communicate that saving work of Christ with wordless actions alone... I can completely undermine the truthfulness of my verbal testimony if I contradict it with hypocrisy. The proverbial way to say this is, actions speak louder than words. Obvious truth. There's nothing particularly novel about that. But I would quickly add that how we speak is one of the most important actions we do. How we speak is one of the most important actions we do. So speech that is mocking, harsh, villainizing, dehumanizing, that speaks louder than any other testimony. It is instantly and profoundly a false witness. I can say Jesus saves till I'm blue in the face, but if I mingle it with a lack of humility a lack of meekness, a lack of self-sacrificing, peacemaking, other-centeredness that the one who saves calls us to, I have blatantly violated Exodus 
20 and utterly undone Acts 1. Thank you, sisters and brothers, for the myriad ways that you do the opposite. How so many of you testify truthfully in word and deed to me personally, but more importantly to all those around you in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. People of God, may all our lives consistently and increasingly reflect the grace given to us by the true and faithful witness, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? O oh Lord, your testimony to us is beautiful, is clear, is sometimes difficult, is a powerful reassurance, and is guaranteed unto eternity. In seeing how you have spoken so truthfully to us, may we desire to do the same. May we associate ourselves with that which is, which is incessantly, unapologetically, always truthful, that our witness for you might be unsullied and match our deeds with that commitment that this world might know that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.